probably the lowest point of his life. He was praying, but what he was praying was not a prayer that most of us would encourage other people to repeat. Lord, I've had enough. Take my life. I want to die. He was sitting alone. He was sitting under the hot desert sun. He was sitting under this little bush, shrub, tree that barely gave any shade. And he was in utter, utter, utter despair. I want to tell you how he got there. And to rewind a little bit, I want to tell you the kingdom that he lived in. Before Elijah was on the scene in 1 Kings 17, we figure out who the king is of Israel. The king at this time is named Ahab. And Ahab is described as a really bad king. The kings in the book of Kings usually get fairly short descriptions. You can cover a lot of dynasties just by saying this king was a good king, this king was a bad king. But occasionally, the author will note this king was an exceptionally bad king. This was Ahab. Part of what made him a bad king in the eyes of the writers of Scripture was that he really lost sight of the one thing, his relationship with God, and he turned not only his eyes, but the entire eyes of the nation onto worshiping other gods and idols, which if you were here last week, we learned that are really no gods at all. So he took the worship center for God and began to dilute it with practices of worshiping Baal, and surrounding nations, gods got infiltrated, and so this was this syncretism again. Society was just everywhere and lost sight of God. And not only was Ahab a bad king, he married a really bad queen. In fact, she was worse than him, and part of his failure was he was passive and let his wife Jezebel dictate a lot of the spiritual climate of the nation. Even today, people who don't know much about the Bible might refer to somebody as a Jezebel, and if that... If Somebody calls you Jezebel, it's usually not a compliment. Jezebel was defined in these short stories in the book of Kings as someone who was very controlling, very manipulative, very strong, and very evil. A bad combination, especially when your king is very passive. We don't get very much backstory about where Elijah came from. He just shows up in 1 Kings 17. God called Elijah to go confront the king. Now, God called Elijah out of his own providence because even the, the worshiping system, the temple, the leaders, the priests, they couldn't be trusted. So God brings Elijah out to confront King Ahab. And as he confronts King Ahab, it's a very short confrontation. He just says, listen, God's going to stop the rain. There will be no rain, no dew for years until I say so. I'm out. And then he disappears. God told him, I want you to go hide out at a place called the Kareth Ravine. There's a brook there and you can live there and be sustained there. And so Elijah went into the obscurity of this valley in the Kareth Ravine and he lived off the brook and food was short there. So God supernaturally provided for him by giving ravens to bring his food. And you can imagine that Everybody who heard that just looked around and said, and went about their business until several months went by and there was no rain. Until a year went by and now the crops are decimated and the drought is entrenched and people are starting to go, wait a minute, who is that weird guy? And the king begins to sit up at night going, I wonder if he was on to something. I wonder if he was really speaking for the Lord. Why don't we go find that guy? After two years of drought and serious hunger and thirst and a, na a nation in panic, it becomes a national manhunt for Elijah. Everybody's looking for him. They don't know what else to do. Maybe if we found the guy that said he could bring the rain just by speaking it, we could at least choke it out of him and get a little drop so our crops wouldn't die. And so everybody's searching for Elijah, but here he is hiding out in this care of the ravine. The ravine 
didn't actually have a bubbling brook very long. It was such a drought that God moved him again. He said, I want you to go now to a village outside of a neighboring foreign nation. It's actually not a godly nation at all, but I want you to go live in the town of Zarephath. I'll show you a person that I want you to live with. It was a widow who was just getting ready to die. In fact, when Elijah approached her and said, hey, can you make me some bread? This woman said, I don't have any bread. In fact, I don't have anything except this little bit of flour and this little bit of oil, which I'm about to make as a final meal for me and my son, and then we will die. She was at the end of her rope too. And Elijah said, listen, I'm telling you, if you do this, God will be with us. And so Elijah stayed there and God, again, supernaturally provided for their needs during this whole drought season. So imagine Elijah's incredible entrance and then quick exit and then he just lives in obscurity for years. No one knows where he is. He's waiting on a cue from God. See, what God was doing was he was making the people's physical condition start to match up with their spiritual condition until they got the message. He was putting them in stomach, water, food drought to let them know that their spiritual poverty was causing serious famine in the souls of the nation. And once they started finally feeling the pinch of it, then they started getting anxious and looking for solutions. And oftentimes that's when we start looking for God is when we don't know what else to do. So Elijah was waiting for the cue when God said, okay, they're starting to get the message. Now let's go turn this nation around. So he approached the city to encounter the king. And you can imagine, if this was a movie, the music would be building up. Here's Elijah. We've been searching for him for years. And he just walks into town. He's, he's in public now. And everyone is just stunned that this prophetic figure has come back. So he comes to Ahab again in short order and says, listen, we're going to have a, a showdown. And you're going to bring all your prophets of these false gods and Baal. And we're going to see who's the real god. So take everybody, get the whole nation together, put this on public news and television, get the reporters there. We're going up to the mountain of Carmel. We're going to have a showdown and get this thing squared away once and for all. So they did. They went up on the mountain called Carmel and Elijah said, okay, here's how we're going to do this. We're going to sacrifice two bulls. But we're not going to light the sacrifice. Whichever God ignites the sacrifice with fire, that's the real God. It was a test. And so he said, get all your prophets together. So the prophets got together of Baal and they built an altar, which basically meant kind of a big fire. They just put uh, a lot of wood down. They sacrificed the bull. They did the ritual sacrifice, cut it into pieces. And this was a normal part of their ritual sacrifice. This is a part of their worship. Except the difference was they usually light it. This time they didn't light it. And Elijah said, okay, why don't you guys go first? You've got a bunch of people. I'm just me. You, you can go first and see if Baal will respond. And so the people began to pray. They began to sing. They began to scream. They began to dance. They began to try to do whatever they could to get the God Baal's attention and say, here, prove, this is your time. Prove yourself so you can be seen as God. But of course, no response. Here's this unlit sacrifice. So Elijah begins to taunt them. He said, maybe, maybe your God is on vacation. Maybe your God is using the restroom. You, you should probably scream louder. He, he just probably can't hear you. And so they scream louder. And in fact, the scripture says they take knives and cut themselves to try to get the attention of their God. Side note, but I think it's an interesting one, this recent phenomena that our nation has seen of cutting and self-harm is actually a very ancient practice rooted in Baal worship. And it is a desperate cry to get the attention of the gods by harming myself, hoping that that will draw some sort of comfort, relief, or saving. So interesting how different different that form of getting attention trying to find salvation and help and rescue is from Christianity where Christ himself was bleeding on behalf of us we didn't have to get his attention he came for us
So, before I leave the side note, if you have found yourself tempted or practicing self-harm and you don't even know why, I would just want to encourage you, you don't need to do that to get God's attention. He already, he's already fully locked onto you and he already bled for you, so you don't have to. He loves you. Just talk to him. He'll hear you. After all morning, afternoon hit, and Elijah finally said, all right, you guys had enough. My turn. So he, sacrif- he sacrificed his bull. He put it on the wood. And then he just upped the stakes. He made it more difficult. He said, <clears throat> go get four large jars of water. <sighs> Let's douse the wood. Three and four. Do that again. Four large jars of water. <sighs> Two. Three, let's do that one more time. Four large jars of water. In fact, the, the, the wood, the sacrifice, the whole area was so drenched that it created a full trench around the altar. And even if you tried to light it now, you'd have a really, really impossible time lighting this thing. And then he stepped back and he went away. <coughs> and he didn't scream. He didn't dance around. He just quietly said, God, This is your moment. Show these people that you are God and that I'm not crazy and light this thing up. Fire from heaven came down, lit the sacrifice, evaporated the water, burned the wood, burned the bull. The sacrifice was consumed. And you can imagine, after all morning of nothing happening, by this time in the evening, the people are tired, hungry, bored, confused, anxious, and God lights up a sacrifice from heaven, and everybody's going nuts. They can't believe what's going on. So Elijah immediately takes this opportunity to let the people know This is your God speaking to you. If you want to worship Baal, you had your chance, but now all of you who are faithful to the Lord, you've seen him act, take the nation back. So they did. They overthrew the prophets of Baal. They destroyed these 450 prophets of Baal. People rallied behind Elijah's voice and his cry and the faithfulness to God. It's almost like with one powerful demonstration, the Lord turned the hearts of the whole nation. Almost like that. Elijah knew this was time to bring back the rain. So he went away quietly, and it says he prayed with his head between his knees. And this is the posture of a humble man who knows he can't make it rain. And he said, okay, God, please send rain. Rain was always considered a symbol of blessing from God or the God's. So he sent a servant to look for rain. There's clear skies for as long as they can remember. A servant came back, said, no rain. Look again, no rain. Pray, look again, seven times. And finally the servant came back and said, yeah, you know, I saw a little dark cloud off in the distance. And Elijah said, okay, get ready because you better bring your umbrella. Scripture says a windstorm took that distant far cloud until the sky was overcast, until there was a downpour raining on Israel. Elijah gets a bolt of supernatural strength because remember he's out in the mountain. The king is riding his chariot back to the city of Jezreel where his wife is located, six miles. Elijah races and outpaces and outruns him and arrives first. We read into the text because it doesn't quite exactly say why, but it's almost as if he's trying to intercept Ahab. Ahab just reflect on what happened before you go talk to your wife. What could God possibly be saying to you and calling you to do as a king at this moment before you go talk to Jezebel? But it's to no avail. Ahab just simply goes and recounts the day's events to his wife, and she is livid. In fact, she writes this... <coughs> note to Elijah, which was in the form of a formulaic covenant commitment that says, if I don't kill you in 24 hours, shame on me. I'm going to, I'm going to stab you like you stabbed those prophets. You're dead. And for somebody who has the power and influence and will and determination of Jezebel, this was a serious threat. Elijah gets this note and he is scared for his life. He runs away. This is where we find him 
in the text that we heard earlier from 1 Kings 19. He can't go back into town. Everyone is now looking for him again, but this time not to bring him to the king, this time to kill him. Can't go back to Carmel. They would know where to look. He can't go back to the widow at Zarephath. He just is in the wilderness by himself, sitting under this broom tree, asking God to take his life. I've had enough, Lord. I've had enough. I can't believe this. I waited for three years in obscurity, in a widow's house, in a foreign country, in a ravine. And then finally, you give the cue, and then you do miracles before people's eyes. The entire nation knows that you're God. They saw you burn this thing. They saw you show up. And then we turned the nation. We started heading on the right track. And people saw the rain. I even prayed and you brought the rain. What more could they ask for? The blessing of God hit their heads and hit their ground, hit their soil. And then within one word of this wicked leader, everybody is trying to kill me. I'm just sick of it. I'm done. God, take my life. You ever been in that kind of valley? The text gives us indication that Elijah was so exhausted. Not just physically, sure, physically, but not just physically. Then he just fell over asleep under the tree. And after he slept, God sent an angel and prepared a meal for him. <clears throat> and the angel touched him and said, hey, get up and eat. So Elijah got up, he ate. He fell back asleep in exhaustion. God sends an angel again. Hey, dude, got some more. Eat again. He gets up and eats. And then he goes on this really, really long foot journey in the opposite direction. He heads across a large stretch of land until he gets to a mountain called Horeb. Mount Horeb may not be familiar to you, but that's what the northerners called it. If you were in Judah in the south, they would call it by a different name. It was called Mount Sinai. If you called it by its nickname, you would call it the Mountain of God. couple hundred miles to get there. Lots of time to think or be depressed. And he gets to this mountain of God. This was where God showed up to Moses and the whole nation gave them the law. The Torah was spoken. God's clouds and thunder shook the people when they were first new as a nation. And so he goes to this mountain. He finds a cave. He camps out in the cave and okay, now what? He's just there. I don't think he had a plan. Remember, this was weeks of travel, likely. Then God speaks to Elijah. He says, Elijah, what are you doing here? God, I've been faithful to you all this time. I have been the one who's been living for you. I've been passionate about seeing you back as God of Israel, but nobody else is. I'm the only one left. Everyone else is so fickle that they don't have any commitment left to you. And now they're trying to kill me, the last of the faithful. He didn't say it, but what he was really saying was, Elijah, what are you doing? I'm running away. What else am I supposed to do? What more could we do? than what just happened on Mount Carmel. And then Elijah is made aware that God's presence is going to show up. But this is interesting. This is really interesting. He's in the cave and outside the cave on this mountain was a powerful windstorm, such a windstorm that you could have been blown right off the side of it, a very powerful windstorm, but the text says God was not in the wind. Then there was a quaking and a shaking of the entire earth, the power of the gods rumbling the ground, but it says God was not 
in the quake. And it said there was fire and bolts outside of the cave, but it says God was, this is so interesting, God was not in the fire. And then Elijah comes a little bit farther, peeks his head out the cave, and it says, then God was in the sound of a gentle whisper. It's a little ambiguous. Some texts say, but then God spoke through sheer silence. And then you get an exact repeat of the early conversation that they just had. Elijah, what are you doing here? It's like he didn't learn nothing. He said the same thing. God, I'm the only, I've been living zealously for you. I've been passionate about you. And everyone else has turned away. And now even me, the last one, they're trying to kill me too. I don't know how you'd expect the story to go, but I would have expected it to go differently. And then God ignores what he said, and he said, okay, now go back on your way, anoint this new king of Aram, anoint this new king of Israel, and anoint your successor to be a prophet. End of conversation. First of all, I want to ask you if you've ever been at the point of victory on the mountaintop where you felt what Elijah must have felt. I'm on fire. <laughs> My words are soaking into people's hearts like butter. This is, this is the best time because I'm on, literally on top of the world and everything is going exactly as it needs to go and the people are listening and hearts are turning and power is happening and I'm just literally on top of the world. You ever been there? Maybe a church camp, maybe uh, God was just really working in your life, amazing things were happening, you got a new job, you got a promotion, you had a child, you got married, your blessings were just pouring in and pouring in, it's like you could do no wrong, and you just felt the wind of God behind you. You ever been on that kind of victory mountaintop? Have you ever been in the valley especially the valley after the victory. It seems worse. When you thought everything was going so well and then abruptly, it just, it all tanks, it all tanks and you're in the valley and you're thinking to yourself, I thought things were going well and then they just crashed and crumbled and now everything I do is not succeeding. It's, it's falling apart in my hands. There's nothing I can do to fix this situation. I thought we had it figured and now people are abandoning me. They're betraying me. I had commitments and they just bailed on them. I had hope in people. I had faith in people and they just overturned it and proved me wrong again. We had resources. We had followers and now I'm in the wilderness. I'm by myself. I don't know where my next meal is going to come from. I don't know where my next bed is going to be. I might well die here and I've got nothing to look forward to. Have you ever been in that valley? The valley after the victory is low. This is where I want to talk to you today. Maybe you're in it right now. Maybe you have been. Maybe you will be. It's very hard to keep our eyes on the one thing down here. But I want to give you two pieces of advice from the story. The first one is this. If you find yourself in this valley, go to where God speaks. Elijah had just lost mm, his main identity. See, for the last three years, he was infamous. Everybody knew, where he, knew who he was, and they all wanted him. But for three years, his whole life's identity and purpose was wrapped up in the fact that there was drought, and he was going to speak the rain. Think about that. That's your purpose for three years. Everything is focused on that moment. And then when that moment comes, all of a sudden, now what? 
My entire identity was wrapped up in this moment that's now passed. Elijah had run out of guidance. See, up until now, it was God saying, Elijah, go talk to King Ahab. Elijah, go to the Kareth Ravine. Elijah, go to Zarephath and find the widow. Elijah, go back to King Ahab. Elijah, bring the rain. And now what? He's got nothing. And where'd he go? He went to the place where he knew God speaks. Sinai, the mountain of God. Yeah, maybe it was a long time ago. But if we were, if we were to find God, where would we find him? That was the place. Sometimes when we're in this valley, what we are tempted to do is convince ourselves God is no longer speaking, therefore I will no longer listen. And I will no longer go to church because it's painful because God no longer shows up and meets me there. And I will no longer read the word because it's like reading a foreign language and it does not penetrate to my soul and it gives me no nourishment. And I will no longer listen to these hopeful Christian songs that once brought me joy because they don't anymore. And what we do is we stay in the wilderness. Go to where God speaks and wait. The second piece of advice. Listen to the silence. This must have been a learning curve for Elijah on the cave because here's the wind, the powerful wind but God was not in the wind. But he was just a few weeks earlier, just a few verses earlier. God was in the wind, the wind that brought the rain. That was God, but not this time. And then there was fire, but God was not in the fire. But he was just last time. He was in the fire. That was the sign. God's power, God's presence was in the fire. Got to listen for something else, Elijah. You got to listen for silence. See, there are some things that God needs to say to us with his booming outside voice, with power, with presence, with miracles, with shaking things up. There are some things that God needs to say to us with a gentle whisper. And there are some things that he needs to say to us by saying nothing at all. what I've had to learn is that just because someone is not talking to me doesn't mean they're not in the room. I don't know what God might be saying through silence to you or maybe sometime he will. Maybe he's simply saying no to our answer, no to our prayers, or answering them differently than what we expected. That's exactly what happened to Elijah. I want you to catch this irony here. Would you, would you uh, hone in on this one moment with me because this is a great irony in Scripture. Elijah is at his lowest point of his life after the greatest victory. And he prays a prayer. Do you remember what that prayer was? Oh Lord, what? Take my... I'm done. Kill me. I'm ready to go. I'm done. I want to die. Would you, would God, would you make me die? God was not answering that prayer. In fact, God was doing the exact opposite. He didn't say anything to him. He just sent an angel with food. Food is about life. With a jug of water, water is about life. With a, did you notice this part? As Elijah's feeling utterly alone, the angel didn't shout. The angel touched him. He made contact. God is with you, he says, by his touch. And he didn't grant Elijah's request to die. You'd think anybody could pray that prayer and God will eventually answer it, right? Maybe it's not time now, not in your despair to die, but eventually God will grant you the prayer to die. But God didn't even ever grant Elijah that prayer. Elijah's one of the strangest death stories in history because he never died. 
God never answered that prayer. He had no interest in Elijah dying. When Elijah went back and he anointed Elisha and he had anointed his successor, and one day where they were walking and everybody sort of knew the hair was standing on the back of their necks, like, Elijah, something's going to happen today. Something is about to, to blow us away because he's going home and he didn't die. Notice this, notice this. Elisha was walking beside and probably a little bit behind Elijah. And then God moved and there was a chariot of fire. It says fire that looked like a chariot from heaven. It went between them and separated them so God could move one and not the other. What was God in? The fire. And then it says Elijah was caught up. He didn't jump in the chariot. It says he was caught up in a whirlwind and taken to heaven alive. And God was in the what? The wind. He never died. Maybe you're praying prayers that God is not answering and he's silent on because he has no business. He has, he has no interest in answering those prayers in the way that you're praying them. Maybe he has something bigger afoot and he's working in this direction while you're looking in this direction. Maybe God is speaking through silence because he's waiting for you to actually be ready to listen. Have you ever found yourself on a repeat reel like Elijah when he was in his self-pity? Elijah, what are you doing here? I'm telling you, everybody's unfaithful. There's nobody. I'm the only one that's faithful around here who has a, a drop of commitment to you, God, and everyone else keeps turning, flipping. Now they're trying to kill me. They're murderers. They're idolaters. I, Lord, I have done everything I can. I've had enough. These people, I'm no good. There's nothing. His, his, his self Pity reel was rolling full speed. And it was all real. He wasn't making it up. He had a bad situation. But I don't know if he was ready to hear God speak. I wonder sometimes if God is quiet because he's just letting us get it out. Tell me about it. Tell me. Just tell me. Okay, tell me again. And when you're done, then I'm going to just change and get things moving. Because with one utterance of my divine voice, all that could change. But go ahead. Sometimes I wonder if God doesn't speak to us through silence because he's using what a public speaker would call a dramatic pause what a musician would call the rest between notes. I think God does this sometimes, and it's not to be misinterpreted with the silent treatment or a cold shoulder. Sometimes I think God speaks through silence because he's trying to emphasize the last thing that he said. I think he did this with Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. He spoke from heaven and said, this is my son whom I love. I'm pleased with him. And then, then immediately Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days where he has no human contact, no conversation. And what's ringing in his ears in the middle of the silence but the last thing he heard God say. By the way, he would need that because 40 days later, Satan would come and tempt him on that very topic. Sometimes I think when God speaks, he doesn't want us to skip it or to move on to the next thing or the next direction, but he may give silence to let it soak in, saturate, digest. Maybe the last thing that he said, we just didn't obey. And so why would he say anything else if we haven't obeyed the last thing? Maybe his silence is just waiting for us to take action. Or maybe his silence is ex accenting and giving a long dramatic pause before the next thing that he will say. Maybe he's setting us up so that we are hungry, so that we're so familiar with silence that when God speaks, we'll know it so clearly because it's so contrasted to the silence that we've been facing. And then when God speaks, the anticipation of that moment will come to us and we'll be more ready to move, more clear-minded to hear. I don't know. I don't know who's in the valley right now, but I know some of us are. 
I don't know who's on the mountain of victory right now, but I know some of us are. I don't know who tomorrow is going to fall off that mountain and be right here. I don't know if God is speaking to you through silence why he's doing it. But be careful how you interpret it. You've got to interpret it with love. And if you go to the place where God speaks and listen to the silence, you'll find him there. He's not done with you. As I was thinking this morning, there are probably some, others may not know this about you, but you're in that valley. And if you're here, you're already doing great as to going where God speaks. God speaks in corporate worship and in church and in the Bible and in stuff like that. But I wonder for some of you if you think, I, I don't know if this valley is just where I'm going to end. <laughs> Maybe I have no real vision of anything ahead. Take my life, Lord, I'm done. I guess, I guess this is all. We're going to end here. No good thing will come. I wonder for some of you, if you've kind of given in your resignation to God in that valley and it's okay, I'm done. If you're here this morning, I want to let one another encourage you. Because I also know that there are some who have been in that place before and God has brought you out of it. So I want to ask you to testify with your legs this morning if you have been in the valley all but given up hope at one point in your life, said, there's no way out of this. God must be done with me. I'm in despair. But God spoke and brought something good and brought you out of the valley. If you have been there and God has brought you out, stand and let other people who aren't sure see you stand. That will be my closing statement. But now I'd like to invite everybody to stand as we close this. This is the sending where we get to go live it out all week in the presence of God, focused on our one thing. I want to make you aware of a couple things this week that some of you might be interested in. Um, one, as you've already heard, is the Discover class. If this is kind of a new place for you, that's a great place to go. It's only four weeks starting next Sunday. Um, you can still come to the second hour service right after that. The second one is a, a four-week class that's starting this Wednesday. It's for those who have been affected by a family member or friend who has struggled with drug or alcohol abuse. This is a four-week group. We meet on Wednesday night. Information is in your worship folder, but that's not just for you. If you have a friend or neighbor or coworker that you think could benefit from that, it's not just for people who struggle with substance abuse but who have been affected by it indirectly. If you have a prayer request with you don't take that with you. Come up and pray. I'd love to pray with you before you go. If you brought a guest, come up and introduce him. I'd love to say hi. And now may the love of God, the peace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you as you go. You are sent.